My name is Julie Pearson Little Thunder. Today is Thursday, September 20th, 2012, and I'm interviewing Les Berryhill as part of the Oklahoma Native Artist Project sponsored by the Oklahoma Oral History Program at Oklahoma State University. We're at Les's home in Edmond, Oklahoma. Les, you were athletic director at Rose State College in your pre-retirement life, but you began your bead art in the late 80s. Since then, your work has garnered a lot of attention and a number of important awards, and you're now working full-time on your art. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me. Well, thank you. Where were you born and where did you grow up? Yes, I was born in Tallahanna, Oklahoma, the Indian hospital there, which is no longer in operation, but uh, I've gone back a couple of times to look at it, and uh, that's where I was born. My, my uh, mother's sister was a nurse there, so I was born in the Tallahanna Indian Hospital. I grew up in uh, Colgate, Oklahoma, and uh, through uh, my sophomore year, and then my junior year, I moved to Atoka, uh, about 15 miles uh, from Colgate, and went my junior and senior year at Atoka High School and graduated from Atoka High School in 1962. What did your mom and dad do for a living? My mother was a dietitian there at the hospital in Atoka. Did that for years until she retired. And my father was a city employee in, in Colgate and worked for the city until he retired. How about either set of grandparents? Did you have a relationship with them? Yes, when I was uh, quite young, uh, I lived with my grandmother when I was about four, maybe five years old, five years old. and. Um, uh, she raised me and we had two other older cousins that lived there also. We were at Pickett Prairie, which is near Sepulpa and Mounds. And I have some very fond memories of growing up there. And uh, of course she spoke the native language and I still remember a few words that uh, she would say to us. She but, spoke uh, Uchi or Creek? She spoke Uchi. Mm -hmm. And I uh, really enjoyed that. And then my mother remarried, uh, my stepfather, and then uh, they came and got me when I was about five and a half, uh, almost six years old, and we moved to Colgate, and then I started first grade in Colgate, Oklahoma. So this grandma was your mother's? Yes. Your maternal yes, grandma? Yes, maternal grandmother. Uh, uh, Were you brought up around ceremonial grounds or church or both? No, not really. I can't remember much about that. And when we moved to Colgate, uh, did not follow the uh, Native American history uh, culture too much. Uh, got into sports and athletics and uh, uh, mostly focused on that. And uh, people have asked me now about that in Colgate. And I don't recall uh, being a Native American in Colgate. I was just another one of the boys there. Mm -hmm. And part of your life, you were out there in Choctaw country. <laughs> right. <laughs> Did any of your family or extended family bead? No, no one that I remember uh, did artwork, and not bead work for sure. Uh, some of them may have drawn or did some painting, but I don't recall that at all. Uh, so none of them did that, so I was not influenced at all by, by uh, my family. So even though um, you, you're both Uchi and Muscogee Creek, right? So which influence was sort of Well, dominant? actually, uh, I'm Uchi, and uh, uh, we're on the Creek Rolls. The Uchis were brought here in the 1830s with the Creeks, and there's a couple of neat stories about how the Uchis were adopted into the Creek family. Uh, and so we were on the Creek Rolls, but we're Uchi, and not, not actually Creek. Okay. When did you see your first piece of Native art? Well, I kind of remember when my son was young. He was born in 1970, and uh, when he was young, we would go to Santa Fe to ski. He learned to ski in Santa Fe in Taos area. And he was probably in his teens when we were out there, and uh, probably in the 70s, uh, 80s, mid-80s. And we went into Morningstar Gallery up on Canyon Road, which is a well-known uh, gallery in Santa Fe. And they had uh, a collection of Native American uh, knife cases, beaded knife cases that the Native Americans from the late 1800s, they had purchased that from San Francisco. And they had about 40. And I just fell in love with them. I'd never seen them before. And I did collect old knives. I've always had old knives and a collection of old uh, kitchen knives, butcher knives. And I looked at all of them as I remember. And as I 
picked up one and looked at it. The, the least expensive one that I found was $3,000 at that time. And that was quite expensive. And I thought, wow, I couldn't afford one of those. But I'll just, and I, I remember saying, thinking this, I'll just go home and make my own. <laughs> so I decided to go home and uh, bought some bead books, talked to some other bead artists and other artists and uh, began to make knife cases. And I, my goal was to make 20 knife cases and put them on the back of the wall like I saw there in Morningstar and, and uh, just be happy. Right. And then my wife said, why don't you uh, go to some art shows? And of course, uh, being naive, I said, and do what? She said, well, people will buy these. They'll, they'll love them. They're wonderful. <laughs> I said, really? She said, yes. So then I began to get into, uh, about 20 years ago, get into art shows. Well, you know, going back to your growing up years a bit, um, you really didn't get a chance to see any Oklahoma Indian painting or anything like that? Well, yes. I recall uh, in Colgate, uh, the post office there, and most of the post offices at that time, the WPA hired Native American artists to draw uh, panels on the wall and there was an AC Blue Eagle panel in the Colgate uh, uh, post office and it was a family scene uh, they were out on the farm and there were chickens and the father and the mother and the children were standing around and that that impressed me I really enjoyed that and AC Blue Eagle of course is a well-known famous uh, uh, artist and I remember I recall that vividly and been back several times and taken pictures of it since then did you do any sketching or drawing or painting when you were little? No, I can't remember doing any uh, sketching or artwork or drawing until I got to college. And I did take one art class, just a uh, drawing class, and really enjoyed that. Uh, and saw that I kind of knew, was a little bit good at doing it. And I've made some drawings since then, but my wife keeps telling me I shouldn't go into painting or artwork, uh, uh, drawings, but um, too busy out of my beadwork now <laughs> to learn another art form. So you really didn't have any exposure to art or art classes in primary or secondary school? No. Nothing, that you remember? Nothing I remember. Uh, and probably had some art classes, but I can't, can't remember them, you know. Is there any other kind of art experience outside of school that might have impacted you when you were younger? No, I don't recall anything other than nature itself uh, influencing you on how things are in nature. You know, of course, Native Americans are very uh, spiritual and into nature, and uh, I think that influences a lot of people and probably influenced me a little bit uh, growing up uh, in southeastern Oklahoma where a lot of trees and, and a lot of ponds and things like that. So let's talk a bit about your high school days and um, your interest in athletics. Okay, um, I think I, from a very young age, was always pretty athletic. And uh, I think the coaches recognize that, most of the coaches do. And so I began to do sports in high school and junior high and uh, did everything. I ran track, played baseball, football, basketball, whatever the season was, I did it. And then when the season changed, I changed also. And uh, when I think when I was a sophomore, I went to state in track and uh, then... What was your event? Uh, I ran the 440-yard 400, uh, uh, race, and now it's the 400 meters. It was 440, 140-yards at the time. And uh, then uh, we moved to Atoka, and they did not have track. So I quit running track. I'd high jumped and did some things in high school at track meets, but Atoka didn't have track. So they had baseball, so I started playing baseball. Of course, played football and uh, basketball there at, uh, in Atoka. And made All-State my senior year, and uh, was the leading scorer in football. And had scholarship offers to University of Oklahoma in football, but Wilkinson offered me a scholarship. Uh, to play football, and then uh, Mr. Iva offered me a basketball scholarship to play basketball at Oklahoma State. And then when I went to Oklahoma State, after uh, uh, maybe about two years, the track coach there, uh, Ralph Higgins, came to me, and he'd seen me run in high school, I guess, and he wanted me to come out and run uh, track for him at Oklahoma State. But after playing basketball for a season for Mr. Iba, we were pretty tired, so we wanted to relax and rest a little bit. So I, <laughs> I, I told him I wasn't interested in that, but I ran intramural track and things like that. 
They would have let you do both sports if you were I think so, yes. Mr. Travis would have let us do two sports. Well, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, arriving in, um, in Stillwater at Oklahoma State University from Colgate and your... Um, have been, you know, basically um, recruited to play basketball, I guess. Can you talk about your first experiences? Yes, at that time, uh, I had not traveled a great deal, and so it was a big deal to go to Oklahoma State. And uh, like I said, my mother and I, uh, she took me to OU uh, for a recruiting trip and she took me up to Stillwater and they dropped me off. And uh, it was uh, kind of a um, unnerving a little bit for a small town boy to be in, uh, in Stillwater, but enjoyed it and, the, and the, the, the students there were wonderful, the instructors there were wonderful. I uh, really, really enjoyed uh, my time there and uh, I think uh, Oklahoma State's a wonderful university. What do you remember most about um, playing for um, Mr. Iba? Well, at that time, uh, freshmen uh, were not eligible for varsity, so we had a freshman team and uh, we had a very good freshman team that year and I started on the freshman team. And then the next year, uh, sophomore and junior year, my junior year, we won the big eight, which was uh, back then was the eight teams in the conference. And now it's changed quite a bit. So I don't even refer to the big eight anymore because people, most of them don't know what that, <laughs> what that is. But we won the big eight in 1965, my junior year. And then I started again uh, in my senior year. So I started two years at Oklahoma State, freshman year, uh, freshman team, and then my senior year. And really, really enjoyed it. And we've uh, all been very active and very uh, involved with Oklahoma State athletics since then. We've done a, a, a 65, we had a 40 year reunion, and we had a committee here of uh, four or five guys that uh, did the, did the uh, reunion, set it up, and they were very, helpful at Oklahoma State for us to do that. So we invited back all the players that played uh, for us in 1965. And I emceed it as uh, you might know, liking to talk, I, they wanted me to emcee, <laughs> so I got to emcee all this and got to talk a lot. And we had uh, the microphone, we passed it around and talked. We just had a wonderful, wonderful time. My wife uh, attended and all the wives attended and it was just really wonderful. And that was such a unique experience Later, we decided to have a Men of Iba reunion uh, a couple of years later and uh, invite back all the men that played for Mr. Iba. And we did that, and again, the same committee, we set it up and organized it. And uh, uh, all the players came back that were able to, uh, except for Bob Curlin. And Bob Curlin was uh, living in Florida at that time. He'd been a, an All-American for Mr. Iba back in the uh, mid-40s after the war and had won uh, two national championships there. So uh, we really, really enjoyed that. I probably got more satisfaction out of doing that uh, reunion than I did even our own reunion because the people were so grateful and they're getting older now and they're not able to travel and some of them are, are leaving us. So I was really, we were really, really proud to do that uh, last one. And then we've done one or two other just uh, weekend things here at Edmond. We met here in Edmond uh, and went to a basketball game for the All College. We've done that. So, we were still quite involved, and there's a, a number of us here in Oklahoma City that were on those teams for play for Mr. Iba, and we meet annually, maybe once a month or two months, and have lunch and uh, tell those Mr. Iba stories and embellish them and uh, make them up. Um, you did take a drawing class while you were at OSU. Yes. What what um, was that experience like? Because you really hadn't. Uh, explored drawing before, I guess. No, I hadn't. I, I just recall it being very interesting. It was it seemed like a small class. I don't remember how many were in the class at the time, but uh, we did mostly with uh, pencils, and uh, it was teaching you depth and uh, draw a stool so that you could see the depth of the stool with three legs or four legs or whatever, and uh, a rope and. Uh, I really, really enjoyed it and uh, don't remember that much, but I think I got a good grade. Uh, I don't recall the exact grade that I got, but I think I got a pretty good grade in that, that class. Did you ever pick up, did you continue to sketch a little bit or not? No, I really didn't. Uh, it, it didn't affect me that much. Uh, since I've been beating now, I have done some uh, sketches of the different Native American chiefs and uh, some of them are, I think are quite good. But uh, you know, I didn't do anything after that. Uh, I was too involved with athletics, and uh, and so we were, we were kept busy during the season. So you got your degree in? 
Uh, I majored in history and took history classes, and I think at the time it was social science or social studies at the time. And that's my bachelor's degree with that. And then, uh, uh, then I got married and then went in the service, uh, active duty at Fort Polk, Louisiana, and then came back and got a job here in Oklahoma City, and then uh, started working on my master's at University of Central Oklahoma. What were you doing in Oklahoma City for your job? Uh, I worked at different places. After I got out of the service, I worked at Star Spencer in different high schools. I taught at uh, high schools and... Uh, uh, history. Yes, I taught history and geography. Uh, and uh, I really enjoyed that. It was like a Star Spencer and then I worked uh, a couple of years at uh, Putnam City. I was at Putnam City High School. Uh, worked there for two years and then went back to Oklahoma State as an assistant coach in 1970. Uh, Mr. Ibe had retired and Sam Aubrey, who had been his assistant for many years, uh, hired uh, Cecil Epperly and I as his assistant coaches. So we were up there for three years as uh, assistant coaches and, and coaching and, and did not have to do any teaching, just recruiting and how coaching. Did you, how did you like that? It was quite an experience. It was really interesting, uh, outgoing, so I really, really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the people, enjoyed the organizations and speaking at different uh, Rotary Clubs and things like that and then going out to recruit. Uh, traveled. I had the eastern part of the United States and Cecil had the western part of the United States and we, we recruited and it was fun. We really, really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it a great deal. Had you had an interest in antiques prior to, the, to walking into that Santa Fe gallery when you saw that knife collection? Yes, I kind of uh, always liked How did antiques. That uh -huh. I don't know where it came from. I, uh, as a young boy, which I think most young boys like knives, you know, pocket knives and things like that, and I, uh, uh, I began to collect uh, old butcher knives and kitchen knives, and that was the knives that the Native Americans used to put in their beaded cases, and so I had those already when I saw the, uh, the beaded knife cases. But I had uh, collected uh, artwork, some artwork, and uh, bear claw necklaces. Some and Native the, artwork? Yes, Native American artwork, and some uh, peace medals, uh, Native American peace medals that were presented to the Native Americans when they signed a treaty. And really enjoyed those and uh, some artwork and some, you know, uh, weapons, you know, bow and arrows and tomahawks and things like that. And so I, I collected some of those things prior to getting into actual beadwork. And then about that time I got into my beadwork in mm -hmm. Santa Fe's after I saw the... Uh... Um, well, let's, let's talk about um, that. You, you decided that you would go home and you could go home and make some beaded knife cases yourself. <laughs> And um, what, how, did you, how did you approach learning how to beat? Well, like I said, I had no idea other than uh, I purchased some books, uh, paperback books that uh, show you how to do beadwork and then began to try to learn how to do it. And I would talk to other artists, other bead workers or other artists, period, about how to get into shows and things like that, the timing on it and uh, really enjoyed doing it. And like I said, I kind of got a couple of uh, patterns down that I liked with my knife cases. And like I said, my goal was to make 20 knife cases and probably over a couple of years, uh, I made uh, beaded, 20 beaded knife cases. And some were uh, leather with beads on them and some were all beaded and uh, put my old knives in them, put my old knife cases in them. And uh, people began to collect them and like them and would come back each year which was very surprising to me and my friend began to tell me that people will like your artwork, they'll come back the next year and buy another piece. And there's a man by the name of Mr. Wilbur who lives in near Wichita Falls, Texas. He came every year and would purchase a knife case. He probably had most of, uh, more than anyone else of my knife cases. And now, I, what show was this at? This was in Santa Fe. In Santa Fe. Santa Fe yeah. Indian Market, yes. Uh, and so I continued to make knife cases and, oh, I, did that for four or five years, I guess, and then began to branch out and do other things. And so now I probably do be to probably a half a dozen, six or eight different items, different things uh, that I do. Uh, began to make uh, Native American blankets, Navajo blankets, beaded those for several years. Uh, began to make wooden implements. Uh, read a lot and saw that, uh, and would go to a lot of museums and get patterns and things and saw that the Native Americans beaded uh, 
uh, wooden implements and metal implements, uh, kitchen items and stuff like that. So I began to do that and then I did some bottles. My wife said, won't you make some perfume bottles? So the women like perfume bottles and uh, Native Americans beaded perfume bottles. And so I began to bead perfume bottles. And then I got into uh, animal skulls. I did bison and a couple of deer and elk and uh, really enjoyed that. And uh, so it just kind of uh, progressed into different areas. And so uh, the latest thing I've been doing is uh, kind of been making uh, beating fish, uh, trout. Uh, a lot of people like to fly fish. And so I've recently did a fly uh, fishing trout and uh, beaded it. and. Uh, named it the one that got away, and, and people like that. <laughs> one so, of your uh, big pictures. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, as you were starting out, were there any um, bead, bead workers that you admired, especially that, did you ever go to anybody for a little bit of problem solving, or? Don't remember talking to too many. Uh, like I said, uh, it's like I was self-taught. Uh, I think uh, many of them were very helpful uh, when I did ask questions, but uh, you know, of course artwork and black athletics is very competitive, but uh, most of the people at that time, when I was going to Santa Fe, weren't doing traditional work out there. There weren't but about a dozen bead workers in Santa Fe at that time, and a lot of them did uh, cigarette uh, cases and uh, pins and things like that, tourist type attraction type bead work. And then there were some that were doing the traditional work, which is what I like too. And I began to get into bags and, and the knife cases and things like that. So uh, there were uh, not that many bead workers in Santa Fe at that time. There were more bead workers here in Oklahoma, probably in the Plains area than there were in the Southwest. It was not a big uh, artwork, but now it's, it's very, very big. It's grown to, we have our own category now in Santa Fe Indian market on bead work. And uh, of course, a lot of people do quill work, but it's, uh, it's really taken off. And a lot of the young people are starting to do bead work now. At the time, uh, it was maybe becoming a lost art. Uh, not, well, not many people were beading at that time. And, uh, but now I think that a lot of the younger people and the grandchildren and children are, are beading, which is great. It continues the art form. You know, it's, it's so ironic because Santa Fe is kind of like the acme of you know, the, the apogee of Indian art shows. And so the first show that you really applied to do and got accepted to right away was Santa Fe Indian Market. Is that well, correct? Actually, I did a couple of shows here locally. I did Red Earth first. Red Earth was the first show that I did. Okay. Uh -huh. Red Earth was the first show. And then Yvonne Carver, Supreme Court judge, I uh, had a show at her home here in Edmond and then up in Colony, Oklahoma, and I got into that show and uh, began to flex a little bit and see what was going on. And then everyone said, well, Santa Fe is the you know, World Series of uh, Artwork, so you need to get into Santa Fe. Well, I applied. Of course, at that time they said, uh, well, we have over a thousand artists uh, at the Indian market there and many, many more than that apply. They said it would take five years before you could get your own booth. And they said you were accepted. They liked my beadwork and I was accepted, <laughs> but you, you couldn't get a, a booth. So then uh, they sent me a letter back and told me that. But then they said, sometimes people will share with you. So I had met some friends at Red Earth uh, from out uh, Southwest and began to share a booth. Jose Toledo, who's a uh, watercolor artist, uh, well known, won many awards out there. He lives near Durango, Colorado now. He uh, offered to share a booth with me. So for two years, I'd met him here in Red Earth, and for two years I shared a booth with him. He let me share a booth. And then he has a, a niece, uh, Avenda Yipa, who makes pottery. She's a well-known potter too, that's won awards in Santa Fe. Uh, she uh, let me share a booth with her for two years. And then just like clockwork, on the fifth year, I got my <laughs> own booth. And so then I said, I will always share with someone. So. Danny Worcester and I, who makes knives, and I've been sharing a booth. Sometimes he would get the booth, and sometimes I would get the booth. And we've always shared with each other for about the last 15 years. So your, your first year at Santa Fe Indian Market was what year? Uh, it was probably 92, maybe, 1992 okay. so or So you've 90s. been beating for about four years. Yes, uh -huh. three or four years. Um, when you were working on your knife cases, um, where did you get your designs? Well, like I said, we would go to, Pat, my wife, and I would go to a lot of museums 
and uh, I would make sketches there, which again goes back to my maybe the first class I ever took at OSU it was a sketching class. I would sketch and take the colors and the uh, patterns down, and then of course I'd buy purchase uh, books. Uh, paperback books and hardback books that had uh, Native American beadwork in it that showed me the patterns and the color combinations and the different tribes and so forth and the style of beading. And so I began to do that and uh, really enjoyed that. Well, and when you're first starting out, you don't always, you know, um, in terms of getting your supplies, you don't always know where you can get the best deals or the biggest assortment of beads to look through. How how did you get your supplies when you started out? Yes, that's uh, another thing you had to learn from other people. How, where do you buy your bees and th that type of thing. And uh, at the time, uh, there were a couple of uh, places that did had beads and they had catalogs and you could order them from there. And then there's another place in Texas now that uh, has bead work and there's one here in uh, Bethany that sells a lot of beads. And so uh, as time went on, people began to open up little shops. There used to be one here in Edmond that uh, sold beads. And of course the beadwork now is not necessarily focused on Native American traditional beadwork, but uh, contemporary uh, beadwork for necklaces and all kinds of beads, you know, that they do they make pins and hat pins and everything, and not necessarily Native American. So uh, most of my beads are uh, from the companies that provide them. There's one in, uh, up in Colorado too that I buy a lot of beads from. And they come to the art shows too, those uh, people that sell uh, things that uh, Native American artists can use uh, will be at the uh, art shows. It's uh, mostly at Red Earth and the other art shows. They'll be there and so you can learn, you know, purchase your beads from them. So we, although as you, you know, mentioned there weren't a lot of uh, bead workers out in Santa Fe when you started, but we had a lot of Oklahoma bead workers, and um, I'm wondering what set your your bead work apart from other bead workers. Well, I don't really know what that would be. Someone else would probably have to define that. But as I see it, I started off just with uh, the knife cases and bags, different bags, because. Uh, those were very popular at the time. I made quirts, riding horse quirts that the whip they would use to do when they were riding horses. And uh, was anybody else doing as many cultural items like quirts or? I did not see that many. Uh, most of them were uh, were, were doing uh, maybe little dolls. They were doing uh, uh, vests and shirts and uh, jackets and uh, cradle boards. Uh, of that nature and uh, bags were really, really popular then and so I did all those traditional things early and then began to just branch out and do different things and did some things that other people weren't doing at the time and I still think I'm doing some things that, uh, that no one else is doing and for example I, I think uh, the beaded uh, net, uh, Navajo blankets I began to do those and I just really love those and they were very, very popular, still are popular. I haven't done many in, in a few years, but I um, kind of wanted to get back and start doing that. And then the wooden utensils. Uh, uh, I don't see many wooden utensils. People still stick with what they began to first do, but then I began to branch out and do, uh, like I said, about a half a dozen different things. You know, I, I do uh, spurs and keys now, the old big Mexican keys. and. Uh, the old Mexican uh, spurs with big rowels on them, and uh, they had uh, old branding irons. They called them saddle irons at the time, and uh, they you could make uh, candle holders out of them if they stand up straight. And I began to bead those, and so I uh, really began to branch off and do different things that I didn't think other people were doing. And uh, and when people come by the booth now, they'll uh, comment uh, that these things are quite different. In fact. <laughs> Uh, the best compliment I get on my beadwork when I come by at Indian Market is that they'll say, wow. And then pretty soon her husband will come by and he'll say, wow. And I say, wow. I said, oh, that's good. Thank you. I said, do you collect beadwork? And they'll say, no. Do you like beadwork? No. But this is, wow, this is totally different than anything out here. And so I said, well, that's the best compliment I've had all day. So we, we laugh and talk about that. Now, you mentioned that you were making your wooden, some of your wooden items that you 
bead or not? No. Did I misunderstand that? No, okay. I just, yeah, I so just you find just find the old, the old, old ones, spoons, antique ones, yeah. Or... They need to be older and, and used. Maybe grandma used them. Some of them are newer. I've had people say, well, I'll make me a new one so I can mm -hmm. use it. And uh, so most of them are antique, you know, okay. whether they're knives or the old kitchenware, uh, forks and spoons and knives and military uh, knives and spoons and then the old wooden items, uh, mashers and wooden spoons and forks and things like that. What was one of the first awards that you won in beadwork? Mm, probably in Santa Fe. I think it was uh, the first deer skull that I made. I beaded a deer skull and it won second place, I believe, in the uh, Indian market several years ago. And I believe that was the first piece that uh, I actually won and received uh, a ribbon for. How did that feel? Uh, it was gratifying and, and really, really very nice. They always give you a little check for doing that. And, uh, and it, it was nice. I, it's nice. To, I, I remember being pretty excited there at the Indian Market. A friend of mine were walking around and I walked up and saw the prize there on my uh, deer skull. I was, <laughs> I was pretty excited at the time. And uh, so did, I think we went out to dinner that night and <laughs> celebrating. Did you, did you have collectors in front of your booth early in the morning? to? Well, my booth mate does. He makes knives and he is just amazing. He's won about 10 years, 10 or 12 years out there. And there are uh, his customers are there at, at six o'clock in the morning when we're setting up. Uh, not many are coming by to see my work at six o'clock in the morning. Even that year that you won the prize? No, not really. It sold. Uh, well, that's good. A lady from Texas purchased it and uh, uh, that was nice. Uh, but I think beadwork is in a different category than other things, and I think probably the, uh, Danny the knife maker has uh, probably a dozen, uh, 20 people that collect his knives, and uh, they just they just wait till each year to, to collect his knives. And his white knives are, are beautiful; they're wonderful. Have you ever beaded any of his knives? Yes, <clears throat> I. Uh, he retired uh, about a year ago. And I took the pattern of one of his knives and I beaded it for him and framed it and presented it to him on his retirement. And he was quite moved. It was, uh, I think it was really well done and uh, he really, really liked it. And then the next year I retired <coughs> and he uh, made a knife for me, uh, Indian corn knife uh, handle and gave it to me as my retirement. So uh, uh, we enjoy the knives. That's wonderful. Uh, you mentioned traveling to museums uh, occasionally and, and sketching. What, what are some of the places that you travel for research? Well, we travel a lot. <clears throat> but the uh, Native American Museum uh, in Washington, D.C. Is, is fabulous. It's wonderful. It's a new museum there uh, for Native American culture. and. Uh, I think probably in Oklahoma here, we probably have more uh, museums that, uh, that feature the Native American artists, and I just think they're wonderful. When people come visiting, we always take them to these uh, uh, museums. Of course, the Cowboy Hall of Fame or the uh, uh, Cowboy and Indian uh, and Cultural Center here now, they've changed the name of it. Uh, the Willow Rock Museum in uh, Bartlesville, west of Bartlesville, I think is awesome. It probably has the best beadwork blankets, everything that you want. Uh, the Gilkers Museum in Tulsa and the Philbrook Museum in Tulsa. There are three there. They're probably the finest museums in the United States. And there are other museums that uh, we've attended, uh, but those those are uh, wonderful museums. Have you ever been back to the, the Yuchi homelands? Yes, Asia? yes we have. We just recently returned from there uh, about a week ago. We were visiting friends in Georgia and the Yuchis were in, the, in Georgia and South Carolina and in Tennessee, Southern Tennessee and Northern uh, Georgia. And we've driven around and uh, seen uh, Yuchi churches and Yuchi uh, cemeteries and different things like that uh, in reference to the Yuchis who lived there during that time. And uh, we've been, this is our second visit there to our friends in, in uh, America's Georgia, which is near Plains, Georgia, where Jimmy Carter grew up, President Jimmy Carter grew up there. And uh, we've looked at a lot of the Yuchi history there. And we stop in different places and see uh, and read the inscriptions on the uh, buildings and things. Neat. 
Um, do you sell your work through galleries? Uh, yes, most of the Native Americans will, will sell work through galleries. At first I didn't uh, sell much through galleries because I was working full time at the time and didn't have that much inventory. So I would have people come down from Canyon Road in Santa Fe that would want to use my uh, beaded blankets. And uh, I just never had enough inventory to give them four or five blankets and then still sell because uh, bead work is quite uh, time consuming in, in, uh, in its operation, and very time consuming. So now that I've retired, I've had a little more time. I've gotten into two or three galleries. Uh, uh, one in the, What are you? I'm sorry? What are your galleries? Yeah, I've been in and out of different galleries. Come different times, you'll stay in them for a year and then move to different galleries. But there was a, uh, a, a gallery in Sedona, uh, Arizona, uh, uh, that was really nice. I took most of my big pieces there. Linda Goldenstein was the name of the gallery, and she was a very highly ranked gallery. And uh, Shiprock in uh, Santa Fe, that Jed Faust, he carries some of my work. And then uh, uh, Northern New Mexico Art Gallery in New Mexico was there. And then he moved from right off the uh, square in Santa Fe to over uh, the rail yard. And then he's moved out to Southern California now. But those were the three that at different times I've had artwork in those uh, three galleries. How important for you are commissions? Well, uh, when we started doing this, I did not do it as an income because I was working at the time. And now that we're retired, uh, the commissions, uh, different people charge different commissions. And that's what people told me, you know, uh, when I first started maybe putting work in galleries. And uh, the commissions are good because the people that show your work need to have uh, some of the, uh, the income from those things. But uh, I don't know, it's uh, different people think differently about the commissions and sometimes it's just, you know, it's a 60-40, sometimes a 50-50, uh, but the galleries have to make their money too. Oh, um, yeah, and I was actually thinking of commissions in terms of people ordering do you take oh, individual commissions, commissions yeah on people? artwork oh i get it yes uh, at first i did not like to do commission work because it ties me down to having to do things that i i'd rather be doing other things and be freelance and kind of do what i want to do i've probably done maybe less than half a dozen commission pieces i really uh, prefer to do just what i do and then sell them but if someone sees a piece that recently sold or something and say, well, I'd like one of those, well, I might make another one, you know. But I haven't done very many uh, commission pieces. A lot of the artists do really, really like to do the commission pieces for people. Uh, I never did get into that as much. Um, do you sell quite a bit from your home as well? No, I've had two or three people uh, that have purchased things from Indian Market that would be coming through Oklahoma City and they would call and stop that had collected my work. Uh, in the last five years or so, five or six years, that will come by and, and, and uh, look at our gallery and I mean look at our uh, work area here and, and, and buy, a, buy a piece. But usually I don't sell much out of the house. Well, I think one of, uh, one of the issues that bead artists have run into is just that in general, you know, um, and it hasn't been fair, but bead art doesn't get the price that it deserves really. And what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think you would know that too, your uh, background, your history with your uh, husband. But um, I think probably next to weaving, beadwork is the most time consuming of all the artwork. Uh, if you'll talk to painters, uh, they can knock out a painting pretty fast. And again, I'm sure sculpture takes a while, but then the sculptures artists that do that, they can uh, make bronzes and then they'll have, you know, 10 bronzes or five bronzes they can, they can sell and which is wonderful for them. Um, very, very time consuming. And, uh, I don't think if they don't pay me by the hour, they don't pay bead workers by the hour. I can tell you that if they did, we probably couldn't sell any of our work because it'd be <laughs> overpriced, but, uh, it is very, very time consuming. And, uh, you can just kind of put a price on it and uh, hope someone purchases it. And I guess sometimes if they don't purchase it, then you can maybe mark it down at another show. 
But uh, Indian Market is the uh, Super Bowl of Indian artwork, and so the prices out there are pretty steady. When I go to other shows, sometimes the uh, the uh, economy may be different, so the prices may be a little different. Do you think there should be a distinction made between bead art and bead craft? Well, it, it all started out as tourist craft, and I think that's the history of beadwork. Uh, selling it. Now, the Native Americans made beadwork for themselves, for their shirts and their cradle boards and their knife cases and things like that. Uh, but then, for, when it began to be selling, then they made the trinkets and the, the uh, smaller pieces that they sold to uh, tourists. But I think probably there should be a little bit of distinction and I, uh, I think that's probably coming. What would it be based on? Well, I don't know what rules they would use, uh, what they would base it on. Uh, I feel like the people that make smaller things n need to enjoy selling their things just as much as I do. But I think the standards will be getting into art shows. You know, the standards that they set at the art shows will decide who gets in and who doesn't get in. And then the people that don't get in sometimes will sell their work to museums or to tourist places and they can uh, sell their artwork at, at that level. But I think the, most of the uh, art shows, the higher end art shows, have pretty strict uh, standards to get in as far as uh, painting, beading, you know, sculpture, whatever you're doing. Um, what about the um, business side of art? What have you learned about that? Well, I think it's it's a business for most of the people because that's their livelihood. They have to have the, whatever they're making and that is their livelihood. Uh, the Native Americans uh, haven't enjoyed a great deal of prosperity and they've had some problems uh, all through generations. But I think uh, uh, it is a business for most of them and you do have to pay business tax. Uh, all of us have to do that. Uh, but for some people, and for me, example, uh, I do not depend on this for a living, and so it's I don't see it as a, as a as a business per se. But again, it is a business because I have to uh, have a business uh, license and uh, pay sales tax, and uh, wherever you go, you have to sign up, get a sales tax number. So I think it's very very important for some of the people. That's their total. Uh, livelihood, total income, but I'm fortunate enough that uh, this is not my total income. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, kind of a hobby, kind of something I enjoy doing, and uh, if we sell out, I'm happy. If we sell nothing, I'm happy. Just to be able to be around the artists, to be in those shows, to talk to people that I've met, and uh, I think the Native Americans and the Native American artists are truly a wonderful group of people. And you have a nice story about um, being at Kroger show um, that I kind of think kind of illustrates the kind of networking and, and support you've gotten from some of the artists. Do you want to? Oh, share definitely. That? You have to have a lot of support and networking, and uh, people need to uh, support you and encourage you and so forth. And Yvonne Cogger, like I mentioned earlier, has several did several shows. I, I don't think she's currently doing them, um, but originally it was one of the first shows that I did. And I was so excited to be there because all the famous artists were there because uh, she invited all the top artists in Oklahoma City, in the Oklahoma area. And I was there and was just so happy to be standing around talking to all the famous artists and uh, happened to be standing next to Ben Harjo and was just, he's one of the top artists and I uh, just told Ben, I said, man, I'm excited to be here. I said, I just can't believe I'm here. I just <laughs> love it. I said, I get to meet all these artists that I've known about and talked about and see in the newspaper and everything. I said, but. I don't know how Carter, you know, I don't know how I got here. And Ben was standing next to me and he said, well, I know. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. He said, I gave her your name. I said, really? You gave her my name? And he said, yes. And so Yvonne invited me on Ben's recommendation and uh, evidently uh, got in and I've been doing well since. So you have to have the support from other artists and from other people. And of course, Yvonne has just been a, a great uh, ambassador for Native American art. Um, 
you mentioned that you really got into your beating as um, seriously uh, as uh, as an art when you met Pat. That it happened around the same time. Can you talk about her role in your yes, development? Yes, I've been making the knife cases uh, prior to uh, marrying Pat, um, and I continue to make them. And then, like I said, she's the one that said, "Well, why don't you try going to art shows?" And so I began to do that. And then she's very uh, creative and uh, comes up with some really good ideas. And I like to uh, have her input into different things, especially uh, colors and uh, I think uh, types of uh, artwork that I've been doing. In fact, she's come up with the idea for several of the p things, the uh, categories or the areas that I'm working on right now. Uh, I see Mike coming back from Santa Fe each year, we would talk about this and driving back and, and she'd come up with an idea and then we'd get home and I'd start doing it. So. Uh, the thing on the Native American Navajo rugs, she came up with that, that idea. She said, why don't you be some rugs? And I said, well, how do you do that? And then, of course, I came home and began to look at artwork and rugs and figured out which ones I could do and which ones I couldn't do and began to do that. And then um, several years later, she came up with the idea of these wooden spoons. And, uh, wooden spoons would be good. I said, who will buy a wooden spoon? She said, well, you just do it and then you'll find out. I said, uh, people will put those in their kitchen. The women will buy those. I said, oh, really? Said, and I had already done a few uh, uh, military type spoons and things that I'd found. And so that was an easy transition. And then, of course, she came up with the perfume bottles. She said, uh, you know, do, do some perfume bottles. I said, they'll, they'll buy those. And of course I knew and I'd seen in the magazines and books that the Native Americans had already been doing uh, bottles and so forth. <clears throat> and so a lot of these things come from her, you know, she's uh, seen things like all oh, these uh, large keys that used to open the big doors on the big uh, Mexican haciendas and she thought those would be cool. And then the branding irons, they're called saddle irons, uh, which are cut down so that they'll fit on the back of a saddle and uh, then you can cut off a stick and out in the back and put it in there and use it as branding and they can make uh, candle holders and so she came up with those. So probably half of the ideas that uh, we're into now came from her because she's very creative and uh, uh, I now always tell people that you know if uh, the Native American saying is that if it stands still we'll beat it. <laughs> so don't stand still. <laughs> I'd like to talk a little bit about um, the piece that you won uh, second place on, I think, at Red Earth, which was a, a shell dressed Italian dress. It was a bead picture, I guess. Yes, uh, I call it uh, uh, bead artwork, uh, where we're actually making a picture. You know, you're doing a picture, and, and uh, I know I've done a pretty good job. If in the back of the booth it's hung up, people will come by and they'll say, Les, well, when did you start painting? And I say, that's not a painting. And they say, well, yeah, that one right there is a painting. And I say, no, that's beadwork. So that was a very, uh, I had to use very fine beads, the smaller beads in that, and had a variety of colors. And then, of course, I see a lot of these. I, I don't make them up. Most of them are seen in pictures, uh, old pictures or new pictures or powwow pictures where people will be making the dentilium dresses uh, made out of a seashell from the ocean. That's the top uh, third of the, of the, of the, of the uh, dress. And then others will be making them from elk teeth. Uh, they have two, an elk, bull elk will have two ivory teeth. They're actually not ivory, but that's what they're called. And they would make a dress out of that, put those all on the dress. And so I had to come up with, be creative and come up with something that looked like that or rep replicated what those things were. And in the dentilium shells, they actually make dentilium shells in different sizes. They'll come oh. from large as two inches, two and a half inches, all the way down to half an inch. So I found some that were smaller and had a picture and did that piece and it uh, had a knife case. I actually had a knife case, beaded knife case uh, on the dress. And then the elk tooth dresses, I uh, found some larger beads that were the color of the elk teeth and uh, they worked out real well. So I've done probably three or four of those in different colors and they're representing a 
a dancer at a powwow, Native American dancer at a powwow. Then again, I either saw the picture in a magazine or uh, in a book, or, and also gone to powwows and seen them dancing and uh, would take notes and so forth and uh, began to do that. Uh, Try to catch a bit of the motion, like a sense of movement. Yes, uh, that's correct. Uh -huh. And a lot of the people say, well, you know, the on the elk dress, it looks like she's actually dancing. And yeah. then I did one uh, replicated from one of Ben Harjo's uh, dancers, where uh, the, the, the cloth on her dress is swaying like this, swaying back and forth as she's dancing, and it uh, turned out real well. It uh, really looked authentic, you know. And uh, so they have it. Uh, uh, they're hard to do sometimes, but you've got to you know, figure out, map out, and figure out the entire thing before you actually start. And the attraction, I mean, I think they are just uh, wonderful, but it's kind of interesting taking from one medium and translating it into another. What, what kind of draws you to that? Well, I did just the, oh, single things like I was talking about, and then uh, to get some depth on it, I began to do different things. And I, I guess there are people that do this, but I call it spot beading. There's another term, another form of bead work that's called spot uh, stitch. But I do it uh, one bead at a time, and that's what's on my dresses. Uh, I'll put one bead down, and then I'll come back and put another bead down, and I'll put another bead down, and it's quite kind of time consuming as opposed to laying down a whole line of beads and then going back and tagging them down, which is another process, lane stitch or line stitch. Um, when I began to do that, that allowed me to make a more authentic looking dress that, and also on my skull, the bison skull was completely uh, spot stitch and then it had a few designs on it, uh, some symmetrical designs on, on the head of the, of the bison and on the eye. But, uh, uh, it's uh, it's it's involved uh, again you have to know two or three different types of stitching and then, like I said the the pictures that I do now uh, bead painting is what I call it bead painting they're done with my spot stitch which is different from the traditional spot stitch which I put down one bead at a time and it makes a different uh, look totally different look what well that's a good point at which to segue into talking about your process a little more. But I just wanted to ask you, it's so interesting to me that, you know, the stereotype, I guess, in the dominant society is if you're real athletic, you're not the kind of person to, to do any kind of sit still work, you know, really fine work. And yet there are just so many people I know that are athletically oriented and they love this minute kind of detailed have to sit still and you know uh, focus kind of work. Do you have any thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think uh, you know a lot of the artwork you really have to be focused and you have to be patient and that's one of the virtues that I think I have is patience. If you can ask my wife she'll tell you that I'm very patient uh, being married to her. But uh, <laughs> I, you have to have patience and concentration and again uh, that comes from athletics too. You have to be patient in certain things that you're doing. Whether it's football, running track, or whatever, or baseball, you have to be patient to a certain extent, and then you have to concentrate, and that, that, those, those things, traits, have to be used in athletics and, uh, I think, in, in, in the beadwork. And then again, uh, uh, you learn to try to do them faster, and I'm trying to pick up my pace because beadwork is so slow, I tried to make them be faster. How do you get faster at doing these things and producing these things? And some of them you just can't. You just can't be faster. It just doesn't work. You have to be patient and have to take the time to put in the work to do it. And that goes back again to, I don't know if we get enough money to uh, pay us per hour for what the work we do. Okay. Talking a bit about your process and techniques, there are both kinds of beads and sizes of beads to consider, what are some of your primary materials? Well, of course, the beads are the primary thing, and then <clears throat> the traditional way the Native Americans beaded was on smoked, brain-tanned buckskin. 
and that is an art in itself. And there are a few people here in Oklahoma that do that, and I've purchased uh, some uh, hides from them. And, and they're quite expensive, they're very expensive. And I uh, just recently bought, purchased some in Santa Fe. Uh, and so uh, when we enter the competition, we usually put that down that it's traditional Native American uh, material, smoked, they smoked it to keep the insects away from it, and it's brain tanned uh, buckskin uh, from the deer. And of course, uh, that's, I think, is all I've been using now. Again, the Native Americans use some canvas, and so I cover some things in canvas, but I don't bead on it as a background, but I've covered some things in, in canvas. And of course, the beads itself and the string, the string you used, uh, the type of string, it's a nylon string now that several different countries, companies make them, make it, and it comes in different sizes. And the needles, of course, is the key thing. You have to have needles and they come in different sizes and the threads come in different sizes and then uh, depending on what you're beating as far as the strength of something you have to use a heavier thread and then uh, the bead themselves and they've really reproduced replicated the uh, colors of the beads uh, quite well uh, and every once in a while you run on someone that'll have some old beads traditional old beads uh, and uh, in fact, I've got a couple of friends that, that they send me some old beads when they find some and they, they like putting old beads on their pieces. And I would do that too. Uh, I would put some old beads, I usually didn't have enough to do the whole project, but I would put some old beads in there and then tell the people that if they purchase that piece of equipment they have some old beads in there. But the, the coloring have really been replicated well. The, uh, Italy and Czech Republic and the Japanese are making beads now. Uh, I guess they're using the original formulas or something because the beads are really, really well done. And uh, the coloring is really good on them. So I'm, I've been impressed with that because I like to use all the old colors. And of course you have a lot of, you know, traditional contemporary colors that Native Americans didn't have. Uh, but they had uh, a lot of the old colors that they used. And of course they started off with uh, trade beads, which is made big necklaces as big as your finger. Uh, chevrons and uh, padre beads and those type of beads and then they began to bring in pony beads which are large beads and they were called pony beads because they were brought in on big uh, barrels on the backs of the ponies and so they began to use those and then on the east coast they brought in seed beads that was the last one probably in the 1860s they brought in seed beads and this is about the time that the Native Americans were uh, being on reservations and being going to uh, schools and stuff and so they did a, a lot of beating they were no longer nomads no longer roaming around they were stationary so they had more time to beat and so these beats came in at a good time and uh, they were called seed beats and again they come in uh, a number of sizes and uh, they're quite unique and uh, a lot of people use the real small ones they're coming 16s and 18s the larger the the number on the bead, the smaller the bead. And uh, I started off using uh, 11s, and now I'm seed mostly. Beads. Yeah, it's seed beads. Yeah, seed beads. Seed beads. Mostly use uh, 13s now. Most of my bead work is 13s. But then if I do a large project like the bison skull, I jump up there and use some tens and some pony beads. They have, they have to mm -hmm. cover a lot of surface. Right. But uh, the beads are, I think, are really, really good. Uh, replication and coloring and uh, and the prices aren't bad the prices aren't bad but you can also purchase some old type beads too I have some old beads still and I would put them on uh, small bags and things that uh, didn't take a lot of beadwork special things um, going back to your knife cases just real quickly you are you using both buckskin and kind of buffalo hide for that do you need that harder part to make the scabbard Yes. You make them yourself, right? Uh, yes, yes, you make them yourself. And the uh, beadwork itself is put on the brain tan buckskin. Right. And then you have to have a base for that in there. And a lot of them uh, 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 will do a rawhide uh, base or a, a buckskin leather base or uh, some kind of thicker leather yeah, as the base. And then you uh, sew that together and then you sew the, the, the brain tan over the top of that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, if you have the knives, then you 
put the knife in there too, and you've got to pattern it for the shape of the knife, for the length of the knife, and the size of the knife. That's a lot of work for sure. Can you pretty much gauge how many beads you need for a project now by sight, or do you kind of calculate? You do. Uh, usually on a big project, I'll have to purchase beads for that particular project. And then I've just got beads everywhere. I've got so many beads, I'll never be able to use them all. Uh, but yeah, you can pretty much project how much, and uh, sometimes there's some rule of thumb and they give them in these catalogs about uh, how much a hank uh, is a string of beads or an ounce of beads, how much that will cover. It'll mm -hmm. cover four inches or six inches, you know. And so if you've got a, a, a five inch square inch something, you've got to get enough beads to cover that, you know. But uh, it's, it's, it's a, a lot of calculations involved, actually, surprisingly. Do you make many mistakes anymore that you kind of have to cut out what you did? Oh yeah, I just read something just recently about that and uh, a couple of bead workers uh, uh, that influenced me earlier, Marcus Ammerman, who's from Oklahoma Choctaw. Oh, that's nice to know. He's an outstanding bead worker and uh, uh, was one of the best bead workers in the world. Uh, and was once, into that bead painting very early. Yes, too. got into the bead painting very early. and. Uh, He's told me many things that I use. One of the things he said was that it's always to your advantage to tear something out if it's not done very well and do it again to make it fit what you really want it to look like. And uh, so I've done that many times. I've done that many times. Uh, so I think that's important too. Uh, and I just read that in one of the bead magazines recently that uh, don't be, uh, you know, if you're doing a three inch square or something, don't be. Uh, scared to tear out half of that to redo it to make it right mm -hmm. and that's what I think most bead workers will do that. What's another thing that Hammerman told you that's been? Well one of the first things he came here to the house up in my studio and uh, said, when, when was this? Uh, this was probably oh prior to late 80s mm -hmm. late 80s he's he moved to santa fe and, and lived here and went to red earth for several years and his mother and father met them uh, and he has a brother that's an excellent bead worker too that's from the west coast uh, the oregon washington state area uh came here and uh said where, where do you do your bead work and uh, it's exactly where we're sitting now and i had no lighting and he said, uh, where's your lighting? And I said, well, it's just right, right here up above. He said, really? He said, you need to get some light, Les. You need to get a light, get a, a light put on your desk there, and that'll help you. And I said, really? He said, yeah. And so I began to get lights and put on my desk. But I was always been nearsighted, so I never had to have glasses or reading glasses and had very good eyesight. And then uh, when I turned the lights on, though, it was uh, like night and day. <laughs> yeah. And so Marcus has uh, influenced me in, in several areas to help me get started. And uh, now as I'm getting older, doing it for a longer period of time, I do wear reading glasses to, to do most of my work now. Right. What's the relationship between beauty and functionality in your work? Well, the things I've been doing recently are more for beauty of the work itself, the, uh, the creativity of it itself. The earlier things I did was more functional. It, they were made for the Native Americans and they had a functional use and that's why they made them. They didn't make a lot uh, for decorations and for beauty itself. A uh, few of the things, you know, they would put on their uh, jackets and on their cradle boards were, but a lot, most of the earlier things were functional, you know, the knife cases, the all those things, the, the bags, you know, that they that they used. And uh, the, of course they begin to decorate the moccasins and the big cradle boards and the jackets and the vests and things like that. So uh, there's a big difference in it. And I think most of my work now, uh, since I'm not as traditional as I was, I've been bead painting. It's more uh, for the art itself, the beauty of it, to actually be looking at it. And like I said, people will, question me that I'm doing paintings instead of beadwork on my dresses and on my uh, uh, Navajo blankets. They'll say, oh, you're, you're weaving now. I said, well, no, that's, that's beads. Those are beads. Oh, really? And then when they're closest, oh, yeah, that's beads. 
so uh, you know it's it's it's, it's a change, and I'm kind of staying in the uh, uh, the area where you make things for the beauty of it now. Um, and you've talked a little bit about um, how you do your bead paintings. I wonder if you could talk just a bit about the wrap technique that's involved with your, like the perfume bottles or the quartz or... Sure. Uh, those were some of the things I did later. Uh, the first things I did, I used the traditional, you know, loop stitch, uh, lane stitch, uh, uh, different stitching styles that the Native Americans did. And then later on when I began to do the round objects, then I began to use the traditional, the first method that the Native Americans had, which is wrapping it around. You just have to wrap it, wrap it, wrap it, wrap it. But again, there's a, uh, the artistic part of the colors and the, uh, the, uh, the style of it, and you know, the geometric design of it. And people, I think probably, well, one of the things they mentioned is my color combinations, how I put the colors together. They really like how the colors are put together, which I don't think much about it, but I do use the old traditional colors, which I think most of them go well together anyway. And uh, so it's, it's, it's... And are they on a, a buckskin? Is there a buckskin backing? Yes, I first started off with, with a buckskin backing around the implement or around the bottle. Mm -hmm. And then I graduated to uh, uh, canvas, mm -hmm. put a canvas on there, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, helps it. And then now uh, I've progressed to the point now where I can put it directly onto the bottle or onto the, uh, the wooden implement and uh, figured out a technique of how to do that, which cuts down on the time involved. The time factor in beating is just so essential. And so I've figured out how to do that now by uh, not putting anything on there. It just goes directly onto the bottle or onto the uh, wooden implement. What is your creative process from the time you get an idea? Well, I think first of all, uh, you have to figure out the idea. It comes first, what you want to do. Say it's a elk tooth dress. And then I have to figure out, well, how am I going to do this? What, what is going to replicate those elk teeth? And how am I going to do this? And then the colors that you're going to use and then you have to lay that out uh, artistically by drawing it. You have to actually draw it out, and then you have to transplant that onto the leather, to, to beat onto the leather, uh, the brain tan. And then you put that on there, and then you have to decide on how your, uh, your technique that you're going to use on that particular uh, beadwork. And like I said, on my dresses, I've been using that spot stitch, which is very slow. It's much slower than the, the other types of stitching, but I think it makes a better looking dress. It looks more authentic looking. And then you have to implicate or put in, in include the elk teeth or the dentillium shells, whatever it is you're adding to that. So uh, it's a, it is a creative process that takes a little bit of time. It does. I say the preparation uh, is more con time, time consuming than you would think it would be. How about your creative routine? Do you have like a routine in terms of certain times of the day that you try to work or? Well, yeah, before I retired, I would work in the evenings and on weekends. I would just work at night for a couple of two, three hours and then I would work on weekends, uh, Saturday morning or Sunday afternoon or something and then you know, you're gonna have time to do other things. But now that I'm retired, uh, I have so much more time. Uh, I actually could just get up and then I can start whenever I want to. I can start at 9 o'clock if I want and sometimes I'll start at 1 o'clock and then I'll work till about 5.30 and then I won't do anything or I'll come back at 7 o'clock and work till 10 and do certain things. And what I like to do is have things in different stages. I like to have things that I'm starting, I like to have things that I'm in the middle of, I like to have a project that I'm about finishing up, I like to have a project that I'm designing figuring out what I'm going to do next. So I like to have uh, different phases of different uh, ideas so that I'm not just bored just doing this over and over and over and over and over. So I, I branch out and do different things uh, and that helps me stay uh, a little more alert instead of falling asleep while I'm beating. <laughs>
What's a project you're especially excited about right now? Well, I like I said, uh, I've changed different uh, things over the years, changed uh, the patterns I've been doing. Uh, I'm into the fish now. I like fish. Uh, you know, the rainbow trouts and the different trouts that, uh, that the fly fishermen use. Uh, I'm really into that, and I'll probably do a few more of those. I've only done uh, two or three on brain tan, and then I did one that was mounted on a wooden base. It was, it was the fish itself was mounted on the wooden base and, and stood up on a platform, and it was probably about 10 inches long, about three inches high. And so I'll probably do another one of those, and then uh, I've been doing um, you know, six inch uh, trouts on brain tan, and I, I enjoy those things now. As far as anything new, uh, I haven't come up with anything particular other than the fish. That's been the last thing that, I, that, I, that I've done. What's been um, a uh, kind of turning point for you, do you think, in terms of a sort of fork in the road moment once you did decide you wanted to spend your time doing this once you were able to? When I first started or after mm -hmm. I've been retired? Or, well, <clears throat> I guess either in either situation. I'm sorry? I, in either situation. Oh, either situation. Well, when I first started, it was just to satisfy my own uh, personal need, which was I wanted 20 knife cases. <laughs> and that was going to be all of it. And then after I got into going to shows, then it became the creative part of it. And like I said, I was fortunate enough not to have to make it my business to make it my livelihood. And so we like to travel and so we go to different shows and I've done a number of shows in different places. Uh, we've done shows in Dallas and there's a uh, Tulsa Cherokee Art Show and the Red Earth here and uh, Prescott, Arizona has a real nice show that we've gone to for years, over different years. And the Phoenix Herb Museum show is a wonderful, wonderful show. Uh, went to a show in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, which was wonderful. We love going up there. And so we include travel into our, our, our shows. And so we travel a lot too. And so uh, it's, it's the creative part of it. It's not the financial or monetary part of it. It's the, it's the relationships that you develop with other artists and with the people that uh, organize the shows, like the Red Earth people and the people over in Tulsa are so nice, the people in Heard are wonderful, uh, the people in Swaya, Indian Market's wonderful. I was on the board of Swaya, which is a governing body for the Indian uh, art show for two years, and uh, the people out there are just wonderful too. They really. Uh, and all of that, none of that could have been done without one, the artist, and two, the volunteers, uh, and then the administration that, that, that run the, organize the show and run it. So I think recently uh, it's been more of a creative thing to, to figure out something new and something different that I haven't done before. And uh, right now I haven't done any blankets for several years, so I think I'll uh, go back and do some blankets. There's a gentleman that purchased a blanket in Phoenix not too long ago and he just really likes the blankets. He collects uh, trade beads and uh, I didn't have very many blankets at the time. I told him I had several kinds. He said, oh man, that would be cool. I'd like to see some of those. So I'm kind of into maybe going back and doing the three different phases of the Chief's blankets that I did before. What has been a high point of your career? Oh, uh, probably my grandkids coming to the first art show that I did, you know, they, they were excited. Uh, How old were they? They weren't very old. They were probably five and six, something like that. But normally it, it was at Red Earth. Uh, of course, you know, anytime you uh, compete and, and do well in competition and win, that's, that's exciting too. And then just seeing all your friends and the people that come back, I think it's, it's very moving for me to have people that return and purchase items from me. And I, when I first started this, I didn't realize that would happen. And the people told me that, and I was kind of skeptical. But uh, it happens, and it's very nice, and those people are wonderful that come back and collect your artwork. Uh, anyway, they came uh, to one of the shows, and uh, we have a director's chair usually that we set up that's up high. 
And sometimes it'll have your name on it. You know, people have done different one different ways. And we don't use the director's chairs much anymore, but we did when we first started because everyone had director's chairs. Oh, they thought that was wonderful. You know, sit up in a director's <laughs> chair and look at everybody and everyone's coming by and saying hi and waving. And so uh, they, uh, that was really uh, interesting and neat uh, for them to come and, and, and see uh, that. I'm, I'm Grandpa Bear, by the way. I have a nickname of Bear. And to see Grandpa Bear do his artwork, that was, that was interesting. How'd you get your nickname? Well, uh, when the uh, children were born, the other grandmothers asked me what I wanted to be. And I said, Grandpa. And they said, no, you can't be Grandpa. That's just too old. Uh, like, I'm Mama Kay, and the other one was Pa. What, what do you want to be called? I had no idea. I did not know why it came out of my mouth. But I said... Bear, Grandpa Bear. She said, that's cool. Okay, you're Grandpa Bear. And so they purchased me a bracelet that has a bear on it, and uh, <laughs> I enjoy that. And I think I began to call Pat. Uh, they call her Pat Pat. That's her nickname. Her grandmother's name is Pat Pat. And uh, I believe I've called her Bear before I even became Bear. So I guess that's what popped out in me as, as Bear. <laughs> and so that's been uh, exciting for the grandchildren to come and my son and daughter-in-law. Uh, but going to all these different shows and being accepted to the shows when you feel humble and uh, people enjoy your work, that's, that's been very, uh, very good too. You know, to be able to be accepted at, at uh, uh, Indian Market and, and the Herd Museum, those are the two largest shows out there now. And then, like I said, uh, these other shows are really unique, and uh, I enjoy them. Like I said, Jackson Hole, Pre uh, Prescott. Uh, you know, there's two sh shows here in Oklahoma. I really support them, and that's uh, it's very, very good. I just really enjoy the camaraderie and the people uh, that you meet and see and get to talk to and go around and visit with. Sometimes you're too busy with your booth to be able to go around. At Indian Market, they're spread out so far, it's hard to get to see some of the people, but it's really, it's really uh, rewarding. What's been one of the low points? Uh, I don't know that I've had any low points uh, during the art shows. Uh, most of the time, I've been accepted into shows. I would think probably if I was trying to get into a show and, and couldn't get in, then that would be a low point that uh, would discourage you. And like I said, it, it, it happened at Santa Fe. I was accepted, my work was approved, but there were not enough booths for everyone to get in. And then they had a little, uh, uh, a little trailer there that if you could share a booth with somebody, then you possibly could get in. And then it would usually take you five years to get your own booth. And so I was able to do that and uh, share with someone and then when I and they gave you a list of people that from your area that you could actually share with and uh, once I got my booth I made a pledge to myself that I'd always share with somebody uh, even though that reduces your booth space but I that allows other people to get into the shows that wouldn't and that's what I, I confirmed when I first started trying to get in and the other shows I got in most of the time um, is there anything else you'd like to add or talk about before we start looking at your work? No, I just thank you, Julie, for coming down and uh, all the way from Stillwater and of course from Tulsa where you live and uh, appreciate the time you take to do this and uh, share these things that the artist uh, talked to you about and uh, allow that to be shared with other people online and uh, different places. So I appreciate you. Thank you. Well, thank you, and let's take a look at your work. Do you want to tell us a little bit about, this is an example of one of your beaded skulls. Okay, I uh, began beating skulls. This is the second deer skull that I've done. The first one uh, won second place <coughs> in Santa Fe. Then I did a bison skull, and then I've done an elk skull. Those are the three or four that I've done. And on this is kind of a contemporary look mm -hmm. as opposed to a traditional look. The uh, first deer skull was a traditional look with a little bit of design on it, 
bison skull was uh, traditional. This is more contemporary. And I uh, did my spot stitching on this. And most of the time the skull is completely uh, covered uh, with the buckskin and then uh, take it off and then I bead it on there and then you have to put it back on. Uh, usually it's 100% uh, or 90% covered with beads. Was that a lightning design or not? Uh, probably. I can't remember exactly what I did when I did that one, but... Uh, uh, Let me have you turn it to the side too, maybe, just so I can see the side geometric design there. Yeah, that's kind of nice. It's, it's, it has a really kind of poignant... I think quality to mountain. the design. Mountain. Yeah, that on the on the jawline there was a, a mountain, like a okay. uh, designed to be a mountain, and then of course mm -hmm. I think the nose was a a, a lightning strike, and then mm -hmm. the others were just designs. His eye, black eye, mm -hmm. is just kind of very contemporary, mm -hmm. and then the uh, that represents a, a mountain. We'd gone out to. Uh, Wyoming and had seen some mountains out there, the Teton Mountains, and that was mm. a replica of the Teton Mountain. Yeah, that's nice. Okay, this is a, a, one of the uh, bead dresses that I've been doing. I've done probably mm, four or five. Uh, this is a, a lady dancing at the powwow. This is an elk tooth dress. I've done them in uh, red and green and then the navy blue and she's dancing at the powwow. And uh, I seen a lot of elk tooth dresses in magazines and in books and wanted to replicate that. And I thought this one turned out real well. Uh, I do this size. I've done one larger, probably three times this large. Uh, one of Ben Harjo's uh, dancing uh, girls swaying at the, at the powwow. Usually they're all taken from the rear like this so you can see the dress and don't have to do much with the face to see the back of the head. Yeah, and I love the, the kind of shadow effect you created on the arms. Yes, uh-huh, those are the, where the, uh, the, the oh, arms are. i to get the boots uh -huh, again. Are, uh, the, the creases there in the uh, uh, elbow area. And this, this is mounted and sewn onto smoked brain tan buckskin. That's the background of it before I frame it. Right. That's beautiful. This is a... Uh, squash blossom necklace that my wife has I used as a model and uh, just decided to do uh, beat it uh, one day and like I said uh, the creativity I guess came out and uh, uh, the turquoise squash blossom necklace and it's uh, replicated the exact size uh, that my wife has and I thought it turned out very good um, some of the uh, squash blossoms are quite complicated. This one was more simple, an older piece, and uh, uh, I thought it turned out well. And uh, this is my wife's favorite piece, I think. Uh, people see it in the back of the booth and they'll say, Well, when did you start drawing? I went painting. It's not a painting. <laughs> I said, No, that's uh, my beadwork. And then if I take it down and bring it out to the front of the booth, they can see it and they'll say, Oh my goodness, that is really nice. So. I, I really like it. It's the only uh, necklace I've ever beaded in this style like this. So I don't know. Uh, I thought the squash blossom was a traditional Native American uh, necklace, so I did that one. That's nice. Yes, this is a, a cradle board. I began to cra uh, collect cradle boards from Deanna Broughton, who lives in Ardmore, who is an artist. And she would make these uh, out of plaster Paris or uh, uh, workable artwork and she uh, sold them at Red Earth. She's a very good artist and she began to make them and I began to collect them probably t eight, 10 years ago and I've made two or three and this is a Nez Perce Pierce uh, blank uh, cradle board and uh, again it's beaded on brain tan, smoked brain tan buckskin. I probably have 20 plus of these and this is a more simple design that I could reproduce in beadwork. Some of them are very complicated and uh, it's hard to replicate them. Uh, I've done probably three or four different tribes uh, of, of this. I did a creek 
and did this nest purse and uh, one other one. I've forgotten which other one I did. But they are very, very popular. People like them. And uh, I really, really enjoy doing them. They look very creative. Yeah, I like the, even the shape of the buckskin behind it. Okay, yeah, this is a, uh, a beaded blanket that I do Navajo blankets. Uh, this design is from uh, Southwest, and I got these. Uh, saw the original blanket in the Willow Rock Museum in uh, Bartlesville. Mm. As Willow Rock is a wonderful museum, has a lot of Native American artifacts there, and this was a design that I just fell in love with and uh, made some pencil drawings of this and have uh, came back and, and beaded it. And uh, it's a Navajo Southwest blanket, and uh, I really, really. Uh, like the pattern and uh, made probably four or five and sold them all except maybe this one and I uh, really enjoy doing uh, Chiefs blankets first second third phase and then all the Navajo blankets that aren't too complicated some of them are too complicated for uh, to really do a, a good pattern but this one turned out very well it's beautiful and the fluidity of the beads you know it matches the weaving Maybe you just gotta. Oh, yeah, you're close. I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, yeah. All right, well, thank you so much for your time today, oh, Les. Oh, no, thank you.